Happy Father's Day! For this month's BOP episode, I wanted to do something appropriate. Especially with this being the inaugural season of the podcast, I didn't want to miss the opportunity. This is being released on Father's Day, so I figured since my own father retired a decade ago after 22 years in the Air Force, I will dial him up and have a chat for the show. It's amazing how even if you think you know your dad pretty well, you learn so much when you have a somewhat focused conversation about life. Call it an interview if you want. Before we get into it, though, I want to remind you that our good friend Matt Rossi is still out there on the Appalachian Trail hiking the entire 2,180 miles to raise money that goes 100% towards cerebral palsy treatment for our friend Nolan. If you haven't listened to the episode when I talked to Matt, just go back and check it out, episode 8. Now, I hope you enjoy this special Father's Day episode for the month of June with my dad. It's the first year of this podcast, and one thing I hear a lot from podcast hosts that I listen to is that at some point, most of them, I guess, they they interview their own dads, and they never talk about interviewing their moms. But I'm sure that's a thing, too. <laughs> but they always talk about when they interview their dad, they have this this very interesting conversation that they would have never had before. And they, yeah. they learn things that they don't know, of course. And uh, so it's always a, a bright spot in their uh, podcast careers, if that's what you call it. Yeah, I imagine. You're uh, putting pressure on them. So with this <laughs> being a Father's Day uh, episode, I thought it would be very, very uh, significant to have a father on. And you're, father. you're the you're the father I chose. <laughs> so, um, and also it's interesting because we both have had military careers. Yours went on a bit longer than mine has at this point. You mm-hmm. put up with a lot more. Uh, you endured <laughs> longer than I ever did. Longer times, but we had we both had uh, a lot of experiences. Well, yeah, everyone's going to have experiences. Yeah, but I mean a, a, bit, a variety of them. We've had very different careers. Correct, right. That's for sure. But what was it that made you go into the Air Force anyway in the first place? Well, my main motivation, oh, first of all, before we start off, I want to say, oh. if I can, I want to say congratulations on your podcast. I've, I've enjoyed listening to it. I think you're doing a, a great job with it. You've had some interesting people on there and have um, worked together with some of those people to get new efforts to help awareness in the military community and, and just outside of the community. So I hope a lot of people are learning some things from yours from your podcast and the, the guests you've had on. I think it's great. So congratulations and I'm proud of you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We can, you can say anything you want. We can cut out any, stuff, any of the oh, stuff. Oh, I know. So. I know you'll be in. <laughs> editing it. No, I can, I'll leave stuff well, in. I don't like to cut very much. <laughs> when I listen to it, I'll probably say, I didn't say that. That's all yep. out of context. Exactly. <laughs> I'm a pro. So what took you into the air force? Well, my, my primary motivation my well, I should say my initial motivation was, you know, my dream was to become a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot, uh, like all of us. Yeah, exactly. It was it wasn't a unique, very unique dream, but that's what I really thought I, w- I wanted to do. And you know, in high school, I had not paid a whole lot of, not dedicated myself to my academics, uh, to to the books and stuff. And by the time I was done with high school, I really didn't want to continue the learning in the in college and stuff like that i wanted to break from it so i mean the, the air force seemed to present uh, a good way to get to eventually get to uh, my goal of being a pilot you know as far as um, paying for education that i could do it at a later time if i wanted and also give me something you know, a job to do in the meantime and, and learn some learn some other skills and stuff in, the, in, in while i go to college so that was that was my initial start so did and, you apply to any colleges? No, I didn't apply to colleges. When I was when I was in high school, you know, my major 
what I concentrated on a lot, uh, probably more than anything else, was was music. I was really into into music. As you know, I played French horn, and I got pretty good at it because I dedicated a lot of time to it. Best in the state of Indiana. Yeah, one of the, <laughs> maybe one of the best. Um, but how many it, French it, hornists are out there? Well, there's there's at that time at that time there was at least one in most high schools. So <laughs> really. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, you can't have you can't have a big band and orchestra without would, at least a couple horns. I would think if that's one that if you want to stand out in a uh, in an instrument class, that's one to pick. Well, that's very, that's uh, it's funny you say that because that's how I got started with the French horn. You know, when I was in first starting out in the music program, it, you know, I was one of like twenty trumpet players. You know, and I was not one of the top trumpet players in my my uh, band uh, conductor said, "Hey, you know, we need a French horn player, and and I bet I bet if you chose the French horn, you'd be like the best." And I was because I was the only one <laughs> <laughs> until I got to high school or junior high or high school. Then, then there, you know, we had we had four or five of them, four or five of us. But yeah, it, it got me in a, into a couple um, statewide type um, bands and. And as you know, it it, it uh, got me to a, a being a band that went to Europe uh, during my high school years. So that was fun. That was a good opportunity. So yeah, I concentrated a lot on on music. I dedicated most of my time to music. <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, my when I went to join the Air Force, my recruiter didn't say anything about the opportunity of being able to join the Air Force Band and continue playing uh, the French horn or, or being in, involved with music. So I didn't realize that until I was already in, of course, and and in my in the personnel career field and too late to change then. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And I wonder if they had the same promotion uh, process that they have now. It's like well, you, you come mean in, band? They accelerate everybody in promotion. I mean, you can't really promote above an E6. It kind of hurts hurts your careers at, at some point. But so, are you saying they they get they, they get to E6 fairly quickly and then they stay yes. there for? Yeah, I think the I think um a good part of their promotions, at least at least what I heard a long time ago, was that you know was there. It's kind of like when you're in a, a a formal classical band or or orchestra. You know, you have seats. The best, the most talented, or the best uh, player is like the first seat, and then the second seat, third seat, fourth seat, so on down the road, uh, down the row. And I believe your your seat position had a had a uh, impact on your on your uh, your promotion and your grades. So strange, so strange. <laughs> well, now, so you didn't go into the Air Force band, which I think at times would be really cool. You get some awesome assignments. You travel around playing music. Yeah, and, lots uh, of travel. You have a good time. I'm sure you get tired of people you work with faster than in other career fields. Well, yeah. But that's possibly. part of being in a band or on a team. Now, what did you do? Like, Because you wanted to go become a pilot, but obviously without the schooling, you couldn't do that right away. Yeah, of course, so... Um, you know, just like when you go into your your MEPS and you take your your ASVAB test and you get your scores and they offer you jobs based on that. And you know, there were several to choose from. And you know, I chose I chose the personnel career field because it was it seemed to be the most like a typical nine to five or I would say eight to five or seven to five Monday through Friday job where you would have a, a typical schedule and be able to go to, you know, have plenty of time after in the evenings and on weekends for, for schooling or, or whatever else you wanted to do. So yeah, I, that's why I chose uh, one of the primary reasons I chose per, the personnel career field that was offered to me at that time. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So you could go to work and then uh, you'd have a night school or uh, yeah. go out and contribute to your future pilot career on the weekends yeah, the funny thing is when I when I was in, I mean, I had no concept of what the military was like other than watching Gomer Pyle on TV and stuff like that. I was like, again, you're coming from Indiana, 
Well, I haven't, and, and, and have no military in my family either. Right, and you had yeah. only Fort Richardson in the area at the time, right, for military bases? Uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison. Benjamin, uh, right, okay. Fort Benjamin Harrison, yeah. But, I mean, that wasn't really like, yeah, you don't, you don't really see much of that. So, yeah, I had no idea, no concept of what military life was like. I didn't even know that until the first week of basic training, going through the lessons there, I didn't even know that I'd be wearing a uniform all the time. I thought oh. I thought a uniform was just for, like, special occasions. Oh, surprise. Like, <laughs> it's like, what? yeah, what's this haircut thing going on? You can I wear this to... every day. Yeah. Yeah, right. So yeah, it was, that's how uh, that's how blind I was about what the Air Force was like or wow. the military was like. But luckily, Did you know I they were going to yell at you. No, no, I didn't know that either. <laughs> it, that was that was quite a shock. But you know, of course, you adapt. I I did I did you know my my stepdad, uh, he 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 did tell me he gave me some very useful advice before I went into basic training, and he said. Um, don't volunteer for anything That's in basic training. Still very common. <laughs> and uh, yeah, of course, it, I I had not known that before, and I stuck to that. I was kind of I was almost as, as invisible as possible going through basic training, and uh, that helped helped me uh, get through it. I think. As you might know, I've carried that with me up to today. I still stay as invisible as I possibly can in yeah. work environments, and yeah. it. Continues to work, yeah, because he had a he had some army time. Yeah, he was he was in the army in Vietnam. Was so. he drafted in? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I I don't know for sure. Most likely. Yeah, so he could probably give you just a, a couple tidbits here and there. Of information. Yeah, yeah. You had to keep in mind that you know Vietnam serving in Vietnam was very different than the time the periods that we served in. And the circumstances we served under, especially mm-hmm. me when it was a long period of peace and, and no major conflicts going on. Then you went to uh, basic and you made it out of that. So then you went straight to uh, down to Tucson? Well, after after a short time in uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi for the uh, personnel training, tech school for six weeks, which turned out to be eight weeks because uh, about two weeks before... I was set to graduate. It was maybe one week set before I was set to graduate. A hurricane came through and closed everything down for two weeks. There was, you know, we had to spend two weeks cleaning up the base and also the community. Uh, that was that was it was a pretty cool experience. Um, you know, helping the Red Cross um, with you know serving in the community and, and stuff like that. I was kind of annoyed by not being able to graduate and get on with things, but you know, after after you know. Getting in, doing that, uh, doing that work for the base and and the community it was uh, a good experience. So I did, looking back afterwards, it was I I didn't regret it at all. Yeah, that's something that those kids down at Keesler have to do pretty much every year, I'd imagine. Put the location and weather activity. Yeah, pretty common. But um, then then it was to Tucson uh, after tech school. And started uh, started in the personnel career field there. Didn't didn't start in on school yet though. Like uh, <laughs> I took my time getting into that. So when I went to tech school out in Little Rock, when I was becoming a loadmaster, the first weekday I was there before class started because I had a few weeks before my class started. The first business day, I was in the education office. Sign up for mm. a clap on uh, English composition and reading or whatever it is but you didn't have that urgency no i took to my get time. to school i took uh <laughs> shoot what was it maybe about 12 years before i started in on that um, were they pushing it though like they do today pushing education it didn't it didn't seem like it i mean you had uh you, you did have the gi a form of the gi bill not like anything like it was later you know you did have that as far as you know, helping out financially, and of course they paid the tuition and stuff. But as far as pushing off hours education, it, it didn't. It, did, it didn't seem like they did back then. This is 1986, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1986. Uh, I joined in 1985. So yeah, by the time I got to Tucson, it was nearly 80, uh, 86. 
And uh, there was not a big, didn't seem to be a big emphasis on it. The times were very different in 1996. Oh, yeah. Very different. <laughs> very and, different uh, military. Because now it's, it, everyone's going to get their education. And with being tuition assistance and the multiple versions of a GI Bill, and now you have all kinds of different financial plans mm-hmm. and retirement plans that they advertise to you. I mean, it's really awesome. I mean, that you know, nowadays you have the financial benefits that not only benefit you, the the active duty member, but also their family. Correct? Yes. So what I did was, well, I had mine, my uh, post nine eleven GI Bill that I hadn't started using yet, and for an additional, I think it was an additional two years, I had to reenlist to transfer it to my family members and each one of them has to be listed and they each have to have a little slice of it even if it's just like one percent that i give Mm -hmm. to each one um at that time and i can then i can go in and i can move it around and distribute however is necessary devin can go on for a master's or the girls they can get a cut i don't know hopefully they get scholarships yeah, for the military to provide those benefits is just is a, you know, it's an indicator of how the efforts that, that they put into um for the whole community, the whole family. Uh, didn't uh, obviously it didn't used to be that way. The, the the Air Force seemed to have, based on what I've seen, the Air Force seemed to have a lead on considering the whole family, not only the not only the active duty member, but the whole family. So, and, you know, there were lots of times during during my career when you were growing up that I was. I was glad I had chosen the Air Force, uh, you know, after seeing a lot, a lot of times they see the Air Force seemed to have better uh, housing available and better programs that the base programs that the family members could take advantage of. So I was always glad I made that choice of, of the Air Force when I could have had could have gone into any branch. I hear a lot of good things about the Navy, too, from Navy folks, but the Coast Guard is where it's apparently at. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Was there ever any consideration of other branches, though? Well, the Navy would have been my second choice. And actually, when I went into the to the recruiter's office, I I was on my way to the Navy's the Navy recruiter. Oh. Um, he was out to lunch or something, and the Air Force guy got me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that was that that's what turned my fate there. Um, I I hear that a lot from people, like they went into one branch and that guy was out to lunch. Yeah. So they turned around and went in this door instead. It's it's kind of reminds you of the butterfly effect, you know, how one little thing can change a person's life forever. Very true. Um, you know, had had I known uh, again my I don't know if you want to say ignorance of the military, had I known the Coast Guard was had the same benefits and was an equal, you know, just like another branch of the military, I probably would have looked very hard into the Coast Guard myself. Same here, especially when I was a loadmaster and I found out that they had loadmasters on C-130s in the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah? I was like, man, I could have been doing that up in Alaska or something yeah. really cool. I've just always loved uh, being on the water and, 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 and on boats. And if I would have known I had that opportunity and not been in the Navy, no, without being, being in the Navy, I, I think I may have chosen that direction. Well, that's great that you loved being on the water because then they sent you to tucson and then uh, <laughs> yeah. texas you know, yeah, san antonio right. yeah all the places you'd really want to go if you love those yeah, we, yeah, lifestyles we, never, we, we uh never really lived very close to water did we well unless you want to count half of my childhood living in italy well naples didn't leave <laughs> close to water but i mean like nowhere like by a lake where you'd have a, a boat or something no, or not not any of the coasts like you get with a lot of my Navy friends. That personnel career, did it allow you? Did you ever really go back and consider that pilot life? Well, not not really. I, I kind of it didn't take long to, for that for that to fade. It wasn't. I don't. I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's, you know how life just life just goes on um and your priorities change of course mm-hmm. um and uh i don't know i always i always did want to be a pilot uh but not my my 
my goals changed from becoming a professional pilot to maybe it would maybe I could be a, a you know get my pi private pilot's license someday and, and and enjoy flying like that. But yeah, I really didn't. My aspirations to become a professional pilot just it just kind of faded. Didn't wasn't really interested in that anymore as as you know family priorities and stuff came along and you decided that you know you wanted your life should take a different direction you know so that's pretty much what happened to that yeah um they they came along a couple years after i joined uh, i got my first duty station and was in personnel they came along and they put um personal computers in our offices um now it, it, you have to remember this was like 1987 88 um not they didn't put a personal computer on everybody's desk they we had one in our office <laughs> and that one in our office was you know one of maybe five in the whole in the whole personnel building yeah, um, so they introduced this box and, yeah and all the airmen gathered around like cavemen and yeah we're trying exactly. to figure out what this thing was exactly and you touched saw, something and it powered on and we saw, you the, out. we saw the uh the golf game come on and we're like wow yeah that's great <laughs> we can play golf um we but yeah there was like not any direction on what we were supposed to do with it or anything so that a lot of times they they not many people jumped on them but you know i was one that that kind of took to it and i had my like for example my job at the time was involved uh filling out a, a lot of forms with canned statements you know repetitive forms and just with with um the same same basic statements uh again and again on each form so you know i i eventually i i made a database of these canned statements and i could easily instead of typing these forms out on the typewriter i could stick the form in the in the computer printer and choose choose which statements I needed to include on the form and it would just zip it out. Now today in, in our recent memory, that doesn't seem like a significant thing. Um, but you know, that wasn't, not everybody was doing that back then. You just with, came up with that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, you probably submitted that and they gave you about 10 grand for that idea. No, I didn't, I didn't get anything. For, I didn't get anything. For we don't have any ideas and incentive programs here. The only you just thing did something for, to help yourself and and a good exactly. idea that could you know make everything in the air force smoother. But well, it it helped me make said, my hey, job. Good job. It made my job easier. You know, I could do a lot more <laughs> in a lot shorter time. That um, seems like it, a genius thing to do, though, that people would want to know about. Well, I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was genius it was just a matter of using the tools that they provided uh in an advantageous way um to for my own job it's just thinking out of the box a little bit really but what it did do they did start sending me to courses formal courses so i could learn more about databases and and uh you know other other programs and stuff like that and it just it just kept growing so they, they did take notice that you were that I, benefiting but, from this device right and, that had to yeah yeah okay so then they started sending you to places your career took more of a, a form yeah and then and then I, I changed offices i went to um that was that was like the re-enlistment office and then i moved to uh the contingency personnel office where they that's the office back then where they would deploy personnel and they would prepare your orders and stuff like your tdy orders and stuff like that um, for contingencies, and at that, at shortly after that move, they came out with this ruggedized, this ruggedized PC that was designed to be deployed into the field, and and the the personnel teams that were in the field could use this computer to to organize and keep track of the people coming and going. The thing was, is it was a great idea, but computers, personal computers at that time were not really powerful enough to to do what they wanted it to do but i dove into it a little bit and i kind of made a reputation for myself a little bit of a reputation for myself in the in the command in the tactical air command back then as they called it back then of a small group of people that could really make this box do what they 
wanted it to do. So, you know, that, that kind of got me into a couple of more opportunities, um, uh, some, some choice TDYs and stuff like that to develop this, this uh, computer program that they were working on for that. So I, the, the thing is that, you know, I saw my career development and my interests start moving towards computers because I realized that, that, you know, I kind of played well with them, if you want to say, yeah. you know. And, and I really, so I really started wanting to get into that. And I wanted to get into the whole computer career field. Um, but I could not seem to get out of personnel because the, per, the personnel career field was just, um, by that time in my career, I wasn't able to retrain out, out of personnel easily. So I never really got the, I didn't for quite a while until I got the opportunity to get out of the personnel career field and get into the computer career field. And so are we in like 1989? 1989, yeah. Four years was your first term? Yeah, four years was my first term. So that would have been 89. I wasn't able to get out of it, out of personnel, so I stuck with personnel. So you re-enlisted and stayed in personnel. Correct. They, did they not have the same program like I had when I retrained under my first term at the very end? They did, but it was, but to be able, I mean, it was similar as far as I can remember. For the most part, there had to be an an overage in your career field. Your career, the career field you were in, needed to be at or over its Manning. All right, you couldn't be short. Personnel seemed to be short forever when I was in, so it was hard to get out of personnel and into something else. And the computer career field didn't seem to have the vacancy, so I was like. <laughs> in a in a difficult situation for the career fields i wanted to get out of and into so i see so when i went from loadmaster to broadcasting and public affairs i went from one understaffed field to another understaffed field yeah so they probably they probably looked and say hey, we we really need this guy and we need some people in journalism more than we need people in in uh i don't know it's hard to say but yeah okay well because they were they were severely understaffed overseas in in broadcasting. You um, can believe that. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's how I think I, I got in, even though my unit there at, uh, at Dias, or 39th, did not want to let me go because they were like, no, we've put a lot of money into you. We've trained you up uh, as an inspector, as a instructor, and um, – yeah, you're one of ours. <laughs> I remember well all the all the effort it took and and uh, for you to get that move made. That was uh, that was a lot of work on your part. So eventually, they did allow you to retrain, right? Eventually, and after after about fourteen years, they did. Fourteen years in, and you retrained. Yeah, fourteen years in personnel. Wow. I retrained. How did they allow that? Because you were you were. Were you still in E six at that time? Well, at that at that time, I worked in the I worked at a head at a headquarters in Albuquerque, operation Air, Air Force Operational Tech and Evaluation Command. It was a very small, very small command. It's probably still out there. They do a lot of testing of um of high tech stuff and cool stuff. But anyway, so I was working in the personnel headquarters office of that command, and they announced a special retraining opportunities for certain career fields and because i was in that that command office i kind of got advanced notice of it and so i was prepared when they opened when the eligibility when the date of eligibility came up i had my package ready submitted and everything and I already had my boss which was the commander of the the, the personnel commander of that command you know she was already signed off on it and everything so as soon as the date dropped, uh, the opening date on that dropped, I had my my application in and already done and everything. And it was, uh, I was one of the first. They only had um, a very small people, very small amount of people, in in personnel in my grade that they were going to let go. You know, they were going to let out of the career field. Yeah, because you're kind of in the same boat. You're a very valuable asset at that point in your career. Well, you know. Uh, I'd uh, yeah I'd been had some good assignments and 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 in some good uh, mostly for the most part I was in uh, headquarters type positions 
uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, I had worked up some good experience in the in the career field. So, but you know, I just I was one of the first to be able to take take advantage of that opportunity, and I jumped on it. Finally, able to get into personnel career or into the computer career field, computer communications career field. And when I went to tech school for that, I was just a hundred percent involved or dedicated. You know how you know how it is when, you know. I'm sure you experienced the same when you got into journalism. I mean, you were just like, "This is what I want to do." Um, you're totally committed to to becoming a true professional. You know that you know you finally finally fitting into something you can really relate to and and uh, really do well at. And you, yeah, you just seem to. You just seem to excel, right? Yeah, and it's kind of interesting when you go in as an NCO and you're retraining with all these young airmen, and um, they're noticing that uh, sort of, I don't want to get too over the top, that fire in you. It sort of motivates them, and they kind of stick on your side, and they're with you kind of the whole way, uh, learning from you in in Mm -hmm. a couple different ways. And so it kind of... fuels you a little bit more yeah that's at least my perspective you might have been going a different angle like you were you were all in on this idea at at this point yeah i was really excited to finally be able to get into a career field that i really really wanted to be in and do well at so i was very motivated to learn everything i could about it of course now people know that when they go into a computer career field in the military that is easily transferable to yeah the outside. exactly and and that had a, a lot to, that had a lot to do with me getting started and finally getting my education started to complete my degree because now i was in a career field that i could gain not only work experience with and work knowledge with but also that would apply directly to my uh, you know what i learned in, in the related college courses would apply directly to my job yeah, well, this so makes like, sense because when you're a personnelist, what are you gonna do with a <laughs> four-year degree? I mean, yeah, I mean it's like I mean different people, different interests, but you know what what you would the courses you would take in for a pers- uh, a hum- human resources degree uh, that would relate to personnel yeah, that really didn't interest me a whole lot, so I wasn't very motivated. But now that I was in the computer career field and could take computer courses and and, and stuff like that. I was, it was just like living it, you know, work and school, really immersing myself into it. And so it motivated me even more to complete my degree. Didn't make the, uh, didn't make all the classes easier, of course, like the math classes and stuff like that. But you know, you you you, you trudge through and you get through. Yeah, I, I got through my math class because I was married <laughs> and had somebody <laughs> in the some... house who understood the formulas and how you could mix numbers and letters on a on the same line and some tutoring there with dashes and multiplication i had no idea what was going on parentheses so you did get that education in we talked a little bit about the pilot idea kind of falling away fading Mm -hmm. but at, at this point had you ever considered separating because you're now 14 years I got to 12, not even 12 years, and I said, I'm done with this, active duty. Had that ever crept into your mind? Well, it was it, it was a consideration, but not really seriously because, I mean, again, I was in personnel. I wasn't really, wasn't really excited about my career field, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been any more excited about it on the outside either and, and didn't, wasn't aware of, whole lot of opportunities doing anything else you know in the civilian world and you know you have a you have a family to support and you know the military you can't can't under undervalue or underestimate the the benefits yeah the support uh, and the benefits of raising a family in the military of course there's some you know there's pros and cons on both on the military and the civilian life but I mean, the job security and the, the medical benefits and, and everything that comes with that military package makes it really good environment for, for, for raising a family. 
and and bringing up a family it's hard to um pull yourself away from that security if you don't have you know a good a good plan for a good exit strategy i should say you know like like you did and, and you know i i really admire what i really admire what you did when you made that move because um it was a very brave move and and but you know i i knew that you and devin had had the skills necessary that you would you would do well no matter what your choice was but yeah it's 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 that's a tough decision to make well that's a lot about what this podcast is about is the transition so did you well when you went in did you ever believe that you that was going to be the next 22 years for you no probably not i didn't really didn't really think that probably until my set i think I think you probably are. I think a lot of people are probably up in the air until they re-enlist the second time, <laughs> you know. And they keep thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'll find something else to do uh, before I, before I re-enlist again. But uh, like, like, like you did. Although you, you did re-enlist the second time, right? Well, I did that first six years, retrained and re-enlisted at the same time. Yeah, you had that extension. You had that long extension, and that was going to take me to ten, <clears throat> ten years. Um, but then what they do is they keep throwing all these other things at you. Like, Oh, do you want to transfer your GI bill to your family? Okay. Well, you're going to have to give us some more time. Yeah. You know, do you want to, uh, stay in Japan for longer, a longer period of time? Okay. So you're going to have to add some more time here. Yeah, of course. And, um, so yeah, they throw all these different incentives your way for, in exchange for more contract time. But yeah, I retrained, knew that this was the field I wanted to be in. But while I was in Japan, I realized that that opportunity, that kind of experience I was getting wasn't going to last forever. And I was gathering all the skills I would need to make my move to the outside. So I started my networking a few years and my planning before I actually pulled the plug. Mm -hmm and separated also to consider getting out you know you have to consider what you currently have um your current situation in the air force or in the military and and what may come and you know there wasn't really any when you think about it and consider it at during my experience there wasn't really any you know it didn't seem like the grass would be much greener on the other side one way to put it you know i mean yeah. you know we had we had a you know, comfortable life. We were living in interesting places, you know, and, and get, I was, I had good jobs, had interesting jobs. You know, it's not like I hated my job. I had, I had, a, I had a, a huge stroke of luck with all my bosses. I mean, there were very few bosses that I had or supervisors that I had that I, I really didn't like. I mean, only maybe a couple outside of a couple of them, the, the, all the rest of them were just great people yeah. to work with um you know I, I really didn't there was no i really didn't have a reason to get out um uh, like I, it's not like i was saying oh i hate this being in the mil military you know i can't stand the people i work with you know that's a I lot hate of my job a lot of that's the opposite of my experience too yeah it's yeah. very interesting because i was in a great location i loved my job in japan but i had bosses that created a very toxic environment for everybody under them uh who i don't need to they were civilian bosses i wouldn't need to name them because they know who they are of course and everyone else i've worked with knows who they are uh and then i went from uh that four years in japan to goodfellow air force base the training base in san angelo and that helped me make my decision that okay things aren't going to be as good as they used to be regardless of what the future holds who kn whoever knows what that future would hold i mean devin had a lot of friends who went from japan to assignments in europe and i was like yeah we could maybe do that but there's not a very good chance of us going to europe mm -hmm. from japan um so we went to Texas, which was okay because it's Texas, but I didn't want to just put all the eggs in the basket of, yeah, we'll be stationed in two years in uh, 
in Germany or in Italy or something where we really wanted to go. And then I would be stuck in that same loop of getting to a new base and having this management issue Mm -hmm. and just not being happy. And of course, if you're not happy at work, it's hard to be happy at home. If you're not happy at home, it's difficult to be happy at work. Most definitely. Um, you know, it all go- comes, what goes around comes around. And, you know, you know, I, I, my whole career, I did not have one assignment that I didn't ask for. I, I really was lucky that way. Um, even after I was in personnel, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any assignment that I didn't ask for. So we, we, we had, we, we got really lucky with, uh, having, I mean, uh, as you know, they weren't all places that, they were they weren't all paradise all the time, but um, you know, I can't we think pretty, of any. <laughs> we that pretty weren't. Much, we pretty much well, well Naples. I mean, Naples was pretty kind of tough living personally. But you really can't, especially at a public forum. The however many people are listening to this, difficult to justify a complaint about living in Naples, Italy. No, no. I mean, there, like, and and that's my point. There, there's a lot worse places that we could we could have been. That especially that we went there twice. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a lot worse places that we could have been that would have made life um, terrible. And, and considering, you know, consider getting out. Um, but like I said, I didn't. We didn't have any place that we didn't go, live any place that I didn't ask to go to. And so we were we we were really fortunate in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Very true. And then, so you did go back to Naples. You lived there twice. The first time was as a personnelist. Um, yeah. That must have been interesting. Both times working with NATO. That's something I haven't gotten to talk to anybody about. What is that experience like uh, compared to, say, the common working in a standard Air Force environment? Well, I tell you, know, I got to preface this with, you know, times do change, so I can't, I don't know what it's like now. Yeah. but you know it was it was pretty 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 good back then uh we're talking what was the first time we were there it was in 92 maybe uh no no 94 to 97 94 to 97 and then the second time would have been 2008 to 2011 or something like that um no i don't know my years no. are all off i can't no. keep track no. of 2002 to 2005 I'm glad you keep track of this stuff. Well, I was I was there, so 2008 <laughs> to 2011 is a different world. That's right. What was I thinking? I, I'm glad the uh, I'm glad the dog was barking during my Alzheimer's moment. So. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the the um, working at NATO. You no, know, so the first time I was in Naples as a personnelist, I didn't work directly for NATO. Uh, I worked, uh, of course, I worked on the NATO base there in Naples, um, but I worked for the Air Force detachment in the personnel office. The, the, the rules were slightly different for that because you were directly, your chain of command was directly Air Force. You had no, NATO was not in your chain chain of command there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a little bit different. But the second time, as uh, in the computer career field, I did work directly for NATO in the NATO command. So I, I, I got to experience what that difference really meant uh, because, you know, in, in the person, when I was there for the first time in personnel is like, you know, you, you try to take care of the personnel records and, and these people's careers, uh, career decisions, and you don't understand what they're, what they're going through on the NATO side because working with NATO is very different. Their, their priorities were different. Um, is much more lax that the, the whole freaking, the whole time frame of how when jobs get when jobs get done is is totally different. It's, it's scheduled around espresso breaks and smoke breaks. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, you go to work in the morning, you go down and you meet, at, you know, you meet at the cafe first thing in the morning, then you go to work. Ten o'clock, you take another break, and then you know for another half hour, maybe an hour, you go to. Then you go back to work for an hour. You go to lunch. Then in the afternoon, you take another break. And yeah, the the whole work pace is completely different, or I should say, was I, you know, no guarantee it's still like that. But that's what <laughs> yeah. it should be, though. It was. It was. Uh, it was nice to 
actually. Um, compared, you know, compared to the pace that that most Americans work at, it was it was quite different. Well, a lot of what we experience is you might be able to squeeze in a break, but if you're not actively working on something, you need to find something to do. Exactly. And you know, being work and but that but that you're I don't know if you want to call it a European pace or a NATO pace or what, because it's a cultural thing. I think it's more of a cultural thing than an organizational thing. But it does when you reflect on it, like when like now when I'm in the civilian world here in in in, in the U.S., you reflect back on that time and you start to wonder about where where your priorities should be. You know, as far as life enjoyment you know enjoying life and get getting the most out of it uh getting what you want to get out of it you know do you want to pour all your efforts into work and work like a madman all the time or or you want to take a, a more relaxed pace and and to enjoy life more um it's all a matter of i think it's all a matter of a person's own priorities and how they what they want to achieve and, and how they want to live their life of course but uh no, there's no right answer for everybody but it's something it's it, it made for a good comparison to reflect on from time to time to kind of keep your priorities straight or at least my priorities straight in my case it's something i haven't really understood to this day so in night in 2005 i finished high school and was in delayed entry to go into the air force myself you would hit 20 years active duty, you could have retired at that point, right? Mm -hmm. But instead, you took two years to go to Belgium for another assignment. Was that just a fork in the road where you could have retired, but they offered you this, so you took it? Yeah, ba it, it basically was. I mean, of course, you know, we... I, I made that correlation about your graduation from high school and going into the military, especially when you had made that decision to go into the military and what you were going to do. I didn't um, make that decision completely by myself. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> but when that decision was when that decision was finally made, <laughs> you know, it became apparent. Okay, so the opportunity to retire became apparent, but I really didn't feel like I was ready to retire at that point i didn't really have one way to put it. i didn't really have my i didn't feel like i had my ducks in a row mm. um i hadn't quite completed my degree yet um i wanted to i wanted to make sure i had my my bachelor's degree completed before i retired because i i, I wasn't really worried about having that ba that degree to be able to to get the best job you know in the, in the world or anything or to make a lot of money i wanted to have that degree to give me the freedom to choose the type of job that I wanted instead of having having to take the job that came to me you know if you if you don't have uh, at that time it was looking like if you don't have a degree you have like it is now and it's even more apparent now if you don't have a degree your job choices are very very limited do you still see it that way now like you think that that degree really helped you that much when you put all of the experience on the resume well, the the thing with the degree is, that as as I think other people, somebody may have already mentioned on your show, your podcast, you know, the the, the degree is like a qualifier now. Most um, job positions that are advertised, it's not what that degree brings to the table for the employer. It's just a it's just a qualifier. It helps weed people out. It seems like, it seems like a lot of employers are using that degree as, as a qualifier or, like I say, to weed to weed the people out and if you don't have it on your resume your resume is not even going to be considered so i wanted that degree to give me the freedom to have more choice in my job uh that i you know i might be offered when i after i retired and hopefully get the job that i that exactly the type of job that i wanted yeah. instead of having very limited choices and having to take a job that i didn't want because i didn't quite have that qualifier that took you to Belgium for two years, also. It's not so bad. So yeah, it was a it was a good good assignment. And the other thing about going to Belgium was that it was a a, a rural assignment. We hadn't really lived in a, a rural place yet. And um, you know, it was I was kind of thinking one of the options after retirement was to move to Indiana. Um, 
to your great grandparents place here that was looking like it was becoming an option so you know i kind of wanted to get the feel for what it would you know what it's like to live in a more rural uh type place not we don't live like out in the country or anything but you know it was a far it's a lot different than the cities that we've lived at lived in in the past um so i kind of wanted to get a feel for that see if that's what i wanted to do or if that's the kind of place i wanted to live in and because you know where we lived in Belgium is, is a lot like where I live now, as far as uh, town size and stuff yeah, like having that. having access to all the amenities. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of, I kind of looked at that as kind of a trial, uh, and also to get to get that degree done in that, that next year. Well, that's smart. And, and also, you know, along those lines, prepare myself better for retirement. Yeah. And... So then you did retire, and you did go to Indiana. What was that like? I mean, because you didn't, yes, you had a place to go in and live, but everything else still had to be pieced together, right? You still had to find a, a job and learn how to live without the support of an active duty community. Yeah, exactly. The advantage of what retirement provided, I didn't feel like I had to find a high paying job, you know, that having that retirement in my pocket gave me still a lot, a lot of flexibility on what I could decide to do as far as my job and, and how I spent my time. You know, I, I could take my time looking for a job. I could take a, a lower paying job with maybe lower, more, you know, less responsibilities or uh, to allow me to kind of ease into the civilian life uh, or retired life semi-retired life anyway and, and and still work things out and while i found while i found my place <laughs> found my place in retired semi-retired life um as things unfolded i what was it uh four five years after four or five years afterwards no about seven years afterwards seven years after my retirement i finally got what i've always considered kind of my dream job uh, my dream position in in the uh, in the IT career field. I I look back and I I wish I would have gotten it 10 20 years before. It would have been a, would have been great to happen back then. But, you know, better late than never. Which is what? What do you do? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> I am the infrastructure analyst for uh a a global company and uh, the I so the IT basically the IT headquarters for this global company is here here in in town. So I work on I'm I'm kind of a, a kind of a, a lead a lead member of a of a global team that manages um, a portion of the IT assets for the global company. So if there's some Air Force some military kid in IT who wants to be an infrastructure analyst, what do they need to be uh, looking at? What do they need to be doing? The biggest challenge is keeping abreast of all the emerging technologies and, and, and where things are heading. Don't get locked into a, a certain a specific technology or, or a certain area of the field. Um, get as much experience in, in as wide areas, in as many different areas as you can because as we all know, the world's changing quicker and quicker, and, and IT is a is a huge part of that change, a, a huge catalyst in that uh, that change. The technology is just just goes every direction. So you just you just need to try to stay on top of where everything's going, and 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 plan ahead and learn as much as you can. Yeah, I'm sitting here wondering how that's even remotely possible. It's, it's 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 not a possibility. It's just a thing. It's just one of those things you just got to do your be the best you can, you know. I mean, because who who knows where where things are going? I mean, you just, uh, AI is 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 probably going to be the next huge wave. AI is going to be everywhere in our lives before we know it. It's it's going to be. I know it's kind of it's kind of scary in some ways, but it, it's irreversible. It's going to happen. Yeah, especially if you're like a lot of us who watch shows like Black Mirror. I don't know if you've caught any of that. You're back on Netflix now, so you can definitely uh, tune into Black Mirror. Let me add that one to your list also. It, it is on my playlist. 
but you'll just you got to take your time with that show and they go into the same sort of thing with i mean of course it's all around technology that show is but one of the episodes that stands out to me is the little robot dogs like you see with boston dynamics mm-hmm. that yeah they turn on us and uh not fun to it's it is entertaining to watch it's not fun to <laughs> see how realistic that could turn out to be but now you're getting down a science fiction path that's i'm just gonna say it's not as science fiction as we uh, we might uh, if, want to believe if you look back at the science fiction of the 70s and, and 80s you see a lot of stuff in there that uh you know in some some form is is present today well i had i had heard i believe on another podcast science fiction writers will base their fictional technologies and their worlds 20 years in the future of where they're of the time that they're writing so Hmm. it is if you go back and you look at something that was written 20 years ago chances are we have that currently we have that technology or some form of it yeah yeah so that's that's very interesting gosh it's scary though isn't it but sticking with just computers that that's some good advice to just stay in the know and be aware. What are, what are some of the things that you've learned that you had learned over those twenty two years that have uh, really balanced your your life and career out? Um, play well with others, basically. Um, it's like we mentioned earlier, like we discussed earlier. You know, the people you work with have a huge impact on your life, not only at work but at home. So uh, always be considerate of others. Be aware that that your actions uh, affect others in in all sorts of ways, in in ways that you don't realize or would expect. So you know, always always try to be aware of how how your actions are being seen by others, uh, and being being perceived by others. I guess I should say. And then during that transition, was there anything that you learned that? Uh, could have made it go smoother or is there anything that you did that you think really helped it uh, well, other than having a plan in that degree? Well, yeah, uh, the, the um, transition program, as you've discussed in other podcasts, the transition program, as far as, you know, professionally speaking, the, the, that, the, the, the lessons learned in the transition program, as far as resume writing and stuff like that, I mean, now that in, now I'm, I'm in this current position, I read resumes um, and, and I, I interview people. And what what they taught me in the transition program it seemed like it put put me a, a, a way ahead of a lot of a lot of other people. Um, I read resumes now, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me? What you know? You submitted this? <laughs> it's just like I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, they obviously had no no clue." Or no, no training or preparation in for for that type of thing, and you'll get glanced over easily if you don't have a good resume, so, or and or interviewing skills. So of course, legally, you might not necessarily know the answer to this, but have you noticed, or even if you have veterans applying for the job, like do they stand out? Have you is that something that you've been able to notice? Yeah. Uh, they do because, and and I've always, you know, I was told this years ago, and I, I think it's still true, that employers value um, the qualities that you learn in in the, in the military, um, that everyone learns in all branches of the military. You know, job loyalty, to get the, to get the, to see the job done, uh, dedication to your job, and uh, you know, I'm not talking about. To the level of being gung ho and and you know all that stuff, but just just the common common quality of of completing and being responsible and accountable enough to get your job done and do it correctly, um, I think is 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 sought after by employers and puts puts prior military people uh, head and shoulders above uh, a good majority of the the rest of af- the other applicants in most cases. Okay. Is there anything else uh, military career transition related that you would want to bring up while you have the, the time and space here? 
I don't think so. Um, I'm sure afterwards, probably tonight, I'll probably be watching TV and my mind will drift off and I'll think, "Daggone it! I wanted to say that. I should have said that." But, but uh, no, I think I think I, I think that's about it. All right, then. Since this is a Father's Day themed episode, what is either a cliche terms favorite or proud fatherhood moment that you can recall? Well, I mean, I, you could lots of things come to mind in different categories. Um, uh, I mean, like for example, if you wanted to go from a proud perspective, you know, I'm very proud of uh, all the, you know, the, the decisions and the, the the life decisions you've made throughout the years have just impressed me again and again. Um, very proud to see you. Um, I look at your picture up on the mantle of the of you at your, your college graduation. Very proud of that. Um, this isn't I, to boost my ego. This is about no, no, the fatherhood. I'm not, I'm not, so. not, uh, that's not my, that's not my, that's not my objective. I'm just, <laughs> as a father, um, especially in, in today's society where you see um, lots of kids um, losing their way and, and, and don't seem to use common sense much at all, you know, you look at I look at, at things you've done and and the way you've you've raised your family and lived your life and it just makes me very proud. That and but that's for, and that that's from a perspective of being proud. You know that when when I think back on on me being a father, I think about I have like a collage of my first my first thought is a collage of memories that come up about things that you and I have done together. Um, it's not it's just like somewhat typical things the uh, normal things that we've done at different locations like like um hiking in the desert in arizona or or i don't know if you even you may not even remember some of these things like trout fishing you remember when we went uh trout fishing up in the mountains in new mexico oh, i do remember that <laughs> yeah it took like a brick of Velveeta cheese up there with it or something <laughs> And the the uh, a day the day we spent in Positano, Italy, uh, I don't know if you, the the uh, soon after the second time that we moved back there, just you and I moved back there uh, first, and uh, we spent a day in Positano. Uh, I remember that day very well. I do have a picture. Uh, I'm wearing some ridiculous glasses. <laughs> yeah, that you'd find on Johnny Depp or yep, Elton just, John, maybe. Yeah, I, I remember us sitting at at that little cafe table uh, overlooking the 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 sea the sea there eating uh, prosciutto and melone, and uh, that, for some reason that some things like that just stick in my mind. Going taking you to Blink One Eighty Two concert, like the one we went to in Vicenza. I think it was Vicenza, Italy. It was in northern Italy uh, somewhere. It was Bologna. We went to. Bologna. Yeah, Bologna. Yeah, um, that, I mean that would be mine. Favorites uh, would definitely be um, around events, experiences like like the Blink One Eighty Two concert because that was just so awesome on yeah. a number of levels. Or uh, even recently, the Formula One trip in Japan. Oh, definitely, yeah. Which the next one, by the way, if it's not Austin, it's gonna have to be Monaco. Mm, Monaco, Monaco. How are we going to go to Monaco? I'm working it out. <laughs> <laughs> but you're invited. We'll fly into Nice, and um, you know, that's how they do it. Oh, that'd be freaking awesome. <laughs> I, better not, better get a, I, get a, I better get a promotion going in. Yeah. Yeah, that retirement check is working, right? <laughs> saving that away. <laughs> Jeez. No, and then I think we got to have um, future... Uh, plans as well i just talked to matt rossi the friend of mine who recently retired and the first thing he's done is hiked the entire appalachian trail yeah um, he told me that yeah for, uh, for awesome. miles for miles for nolan i told him i said i think i've got to get out there i'm motivated to get on that appalachian trail sometime uh, <laughs> not not for the entirety of it no possible way i'd be doing that just to experience part of it. But just to go up and Yeah, yeah, experience part of it. Well, I got I got the camping equipment ready. And then <laughs> I, I keep telling Devin that I'm gonna be taking a uh, motorcycle trip sometime. 
<laughs> so that's also uh, something in the planning books for us. Bucket list. I'm glad you were able to uh, take some time out of your day and sit and speak. I mean, we talk a lot, but just for the purpose of this podcast and sharing your experiences with myself and with the audience who hopefully can get some some good out of that. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Enjoy your Father's Day. Yeah, happy Father's Day then. (laughs) Happy Father's Day to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and happy Father's Day to you and your fathers. I also want to let you know that another friend of the show, Joshua DeFour, is getting set to begin production on his film The Eleventh Order. Follow that project over on the film's Facebook page. You can just search that. You can also follow Miles for Nolan and that cause there on Facebook, not on the Eleventh Order page. They have their own. As always, you can find this podcast on the social channels. Visit bootsoffpodcast.com and send me guest ideas. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Podcast. 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 Podcast.